I, uh, I know we have a very light crowd and I'm okay with that. But for those of you guys who are here, I appreciate it. Um, and we are gonna, like I said, we're recording this, so it's all good. Thank you so much for coming. You earned it, baby. Good to see you. Thanks for coming. You're good. I'm not worried. I'm not worried. I completely get it. Um, we're all running late, so I understand that. Um, so I, I decided to do a session on real estate negotiation because I get asked this question a ton. Um, people are always asking me about, you know, uh, how do I negotiate? How do I, you know, how do I get these deals done? Like deal doctoring is such a big part of, of this business. And, you know, it's something that's a constant question that I get asked. So for me personally, um, I want to start with, a, with an icebreaker. And it's just, for those of you who have, have done this with me in Maplewood before, please don't spoil it. Um, because I, I think it'll be fun for those who, who have not done this before. Um, it's just gonna take a minute long, but if you guys could all stand up and grab a partner. Come on, everybody do it. I see you back there sitting by yourself. Raise your hand if you don't have a partner. You guys go ahead. Uh, Steve, maybe you go back there. Oh no, you guys have a part. I'm sorry, I didn't see you there. All right. It's, I promise, it's one minute long. You're not gonna have to be lifelong friends. Maybe you will be, hopefully. Um, all right, so the, the uh, exercise goes a little like this. We're gonna grab each other's arms. Ben, let me just show you real quick. We're gonna grab each other's arms. If I put Ben's arm down, I get a point. Fair? We're gonna go for one minute. We're gonna go for one minute, starting right now. Count score. Count the score. You guys aren't playing? It's a, it's a standstill? All right, we'll go, we'll go 30 seconds. All right, 10 more seconds. And we're done. All right. Everybody, everybody sit down. So, who in here thinks that they have the highest score? Anybody thinks that they have a high score? Go ahead, what was the score? Maybe 15. 15? So it's 15 to, did you score? He gave you two, okay. Um, anybody have a higher score than 15? No? All right, so the, the reason why I love this exercise is because I never call this arm wrestling. So Ben, stand up for a second. So you could just as easily have went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and scored a lot of points, but what we do in life and what we, you know, what we tend to think about is it's adversarial. Like, why not make it friendly? Why not play as a team and get as many points as you possibly can? We don't always think that way. And I think that in negotiation, we do the exact same thing. We automatically view the other side as like, I gotta beat them, why? Like, what if we both win together? What if there are ways that we could work together to try to get the best outcome possible? Why don't we think like that? It's just not human nature sometimes. So I love starting with that uh, exercise. I learned that exercise uh, at a course that I took. I'm gonna to talk to you about in a second. But the point is build bridges, not walls. Like, and a lot of negotiation, a lot of what I'm about to talk about is that. You know, we heard about it like with, you know, the rookie panel earlier. What did they talk about? They said like, you know, we, we work with the people around us. We learn from the people around us. We're always trying to build together. I mean, I know Ryan is certainly that way about teamwork. Everybody who we spoke to today, or we learned from today, is all about that, and yet not everybody does it by, by nature. So what I wanted to talk about is, you know, is really, I do a lot of negotiating. I mean, my whole life is a negotiation. Like, and, and truthfully, you guys do too. 
Like you walk into a store, sometimes you negotiate back and forth over price. Like you negotiate with your kids all the time if you have kids. Like that's a constant negotiation. Like trying to get them to bed at night is a negotiation. Like trying to get them in the bath is a negotiation. It's always that. So, you know, the, the truth of it is, is like we all negotiate at a, at a you know, at a, at a crazy pace. We don't necessarily always think about it that way. So for me, I've been doing this for about 20 years. And in the 20 years that I've been doing this, like, I mean, my operation has done billions and billions of dollars of real estate. Like, and believe me, anytime there's like a intense negotiation, I get pulled into it. So I do it all day long, every day. And what I realized is I'm very good at it on some level, and I'm gonna speak to that. So I'm very good at asking the right questions in a negotiation. That's a skill set that I have. I'm very good at like, understanding where the motivations lie, like what motivates you to do something, those, those are a skill set. But what I realized over time was, you know, I don't know formal negotiation strategies. Like that's not, that wasn't what I understood. I just knew what questions to ask. I knew, you know, ultimately motivation matters. Like that's some basic stuff, but like formal negotiation strategy is a lot more than that. So, you know, I lack that structure, so to speak, so then I read this book called Getting to Yes. If you haven't read the book, it's a short read, read it. Like, I mean, and if you think about this, when you talk about negotiation, we all, like, we will spend a lot of time focused on prospecting, we should at least, but, and learning about prospecting and how do I market and how do I, you know, go out there and build relationships and how do I do all these different skill sets in real estate. How much time have you spent on formally learning negotiation? We do it every day. It's one of the main things that people care about when they're deciding whether to work with us or not. Like, is this person a skilled negotiator? Well, how many people have taken the time to really learn that skill besides the everyday experience that you have? I was at 30 under 30 session, and what I realized um, at this session is I had read that book, I love that book, um, and we were, the book came up and one of the other 30 under 30 said, well, just so you understand, there's two people that wrote this book, Roger Fisher and William Urey. So they've created the Harvard Negotiation Project. Um, basically the Harvard Business School, Harvard Law School created this negotiation and leadership um, project. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a series of learning, series of classes. And you know, they're the founders of that of, at Harvard. So I read this book, it's you know, just a brilliant book. And then I was sitting in this class, in this mastermind rather, and somebody said, oh yeah, yeah, I love that book. Matter of fact, I actually went to that class. And I said, what are you talking about? And they said, there's a class at Harvard that you could take that you could actually get a certificate in negotiation. And I was like, get out of here. And they said, yeah. So that's exactly what I did. I met with William Urey. I literally learned from the author and from the founder of the Harvard Business School. And you know, I went to this program on leadership and negotiation. And it was just game changing. I would recommend every single person in here think about doing it. It's not cheap. It's gonna run, it's like maybe a week long class, so you gotta pay for obviously, you know, where you're staying and everything else. But the course, um, I wanna say everything was like four or $5,000, maybe $6,000 total. Best investment I could have made. Why? Because now I have a framework for negotiation that I never had before. It also looks pretty good when you're sitting in front of a seller and you say like, well, why you? Well, listen, not only have I negotiated a, you know, a million times over and gotten this many clients X, Y, and Z, but I've also been like formally trained in negotiation at Harvard. It's not a bad thing to say to somebody. So this presentation is a combination of what I learned at Harvard and my own experience in real estate because I feel like it's only applicable to you if we relate it back to real estate. Because you got people in there that are in all different businesses, you know, that are, that are learning at this course, and it's not necessarily, you know, all real estate related. So preparing to negotiate, this is gonna be a framework for what we're gonna talk about. There are three key things that, um, that we'll start with, and I'm gonna to touch upon each of them to give you this baseline. We're gonna start very basic and build up, but I guarantee you you're gonna learn some things even with the basic stuff. So party diagramming is the first thing. Party diagramming is who are the parties to this negotiation and what are their underlying interests? The first thing you should do when you enter a negotiation is figure that out and we're gonna talk about why. The second one is called BATNA, BATNA Assessments. So BATNA Assessments is the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. 
What is the other option? That's what a BATNA is. So what will each party do without an agreement? In a pure price negotiation, the qualification of the BATNA yields reservation prices for each side. I promise you I'm gonna explain that. The last thing is ZOPA. So ZOPA analysis is the zone of possible agreement. Given parties, interests, and BATNAs, where is the deal space? Where are we going to find compromise in this, in this deal? And you know, ultimately, what does a good deal look like? Is the deal sustainable? Is it something that we could get to a closing table on? So that's just a basic framework. And now I'm gonna talk about how to implement this stuff in real estate. So number one is party diagramming. So when you talk about party diagramming, the first example that I'm gonna give you is you, know, you walk in and let's just say it's a messy divorce situation. So we've all dealt with that in real estate, that's normal. When you're diagramming the parties and trying to figure out what their underlying interests are, let's just assume it's a divorce situation and you meet with both parties and the husband doesn't want a divorce, they're very much still in love, like they have no job, they are not interested in dating at all, they don't like change, and they're not interested in moving. Isn't it important to know that? You're over here positioning, and let's just say the wife is the exact opposite, wants a divorce, no longer in love, great job, has a new love, needs change, wants to move yesterday. They are on completely opposite ends of the spectrum here. Wouldn't it be important to understand that when you're over there presenting? You know, one of the conversations when you're, when you're dealing with divorce is, you know, and you don't want to get into that tricky subject of asking their emotions related to each other. I understand that. You know, we're a united front for this sale. Like, you know, but asking the question in your own words of, you know, are you on board? Do you want to sell this house? Like getting to that. Why? Because if they say to you, like, I have no interest in selling. Well, now you could stand on your head and spin and tell them all the wonderful things you're going to do for them. The better of an agent you are, the worse you are in this person's opinion. They don't want a great agent. They want somebody who can't do their job correctly because they want to sabotage the deal. If you don't know that up front, you're at a disadvantage. So that's something that like understanding, diagramming who the parties are, crucial. I'll give you another example of, uh, you know, of party uh, diagramming. Like let's just say you, you, know, you meet a lovely couple, they're deciding that they want to buy a house. Awesome, they're excited, let's go out or go see, look, look at homes. Everything is perfect, wonderful situation. Then you realize later that the father is actually the one that's supplying the cash for this purchase. And he shows up to the home inspection and he's like, you know, measuring every wall like fathers tend to do. So in that situation, like you don't know who the decision maker is. Like you thought you knew who the decision maker was, but you don't know necessarily that this, this guy may not like any house that wasn't built after 19, you know, uh, 22, or two, uh, excuse me, 2022. Like I want new construction for my kid. Like if it was built, you know, hundred years ago, they may love that. The father might not. Well, now you're, you know, you're essentially doing all this time and effort and everything else. And the decision maker, the real decision maker, the person who's bringing the money to the table is not interested in whatever you're selling. So again, like that's, that's as simple as like, are you the decision maker? Like, you know, you don't have to ask them outright in that, in that, you know, as deliberately as I just did, but just understanding like, who are the decision makers to this transaction? It's so crucial. It's such a way to avoid a waste of your time. Number two, BATNA. BATNA is such an important thing that you have to, you know, zoom in on. It should be, you know, one of the things that every single time you get in a negotiation, you focus on. So BATNA is the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. Basically, I could come to an agreement on, you know, this, you know, whatever it is, whatever the terms are, or I could go right, my other transaction, you know, my other direction. What does that other option look like? You have to understand BATNA for every transaction. I'm gonna give you a, a handful of, uh, you know, BATNA examples. The first one is a very strong BATNA. It's related to relocation. So you get a client and they're relocating out of the area. And let's just say hypothetically that that client is working with, um, I don't know, Johnson & Johnson. And Johnson & Johnson is their employer. They're very high up at, you know, at Johnson & Johnson and you know that they have a package. They're moving to Texas or wherever. Well, here's the thought process. Like the house comes on the market for 400,000. The buyer makes an offer of 350. 
The problem is the Relo company guaranteed that purchase of 375. Why would that seller ever accept 350? They wouldn't. They might as well just wait it out. You know, 30 days from now, the Relo company is gonna buy me out at 375. If I can't get to 375, I'm not gonna accept an offer. Why the hell would I accept an offer? I'm gonna make more money with the Relo company. And then it's their problem because that's how a lot of these relocation packages work. So you could be banging your head against the wall and thinking to yourself like, I don't understand. This is a good offer relative to the market, but their BATNA is stronger. Their BATNA in this case is 375. Why would they accept less than that? They wouldn't. You have to understand people's options in a transaction. Otherwise you're going to be like struggling with them to make a decision and they're not going to make the decision you want simply because they have a better option on the table give you a really weak BATNA example, and it involves me. The other day, Super Bowl Sunday, my daughter was with my wife at a play date with kids. She was balancing herself on one of these bars and slipped off the bar and hit her face on the opposite parallel bar. So if you don't know this, and I'm sure anybody who's a parent here gets it, like that's like my heart and soul. So when Angelina is her name, she's six years old, she's a trooper, but she busted her face open, like bleeding all over the place. My, my wife calls me and is like, we have a problem. She drives home, we have four kids, girl, dad. Um, we have four kids and basically, you know, when she gets home, I jump in the car and take her to, you know, basically to the hospital, to the ER. Spent the entire Super Bowl in the ER dealing with this. So here's the thing. I, I get there, and for those of you who can't tell, maybe you can, is I have, I don't know, 100 plus stitches in my face. Like, you know, over the years, I've gotten so many different injuries, sports related injuries, and stuff like that. So I know this world, I know what it looks like, and she got it right through her eyebrow, which I also happen to have. So I know that how important it is to get a plastic surgeon. Like I'm not letting some random like PA or you know, some doctor in the ER do this. This is my six year old baby girl. Like there is no way that I'm gonna allow her to walk around with a scar for the rest of her life because I didn't get a plastic surgeon. Like that's my job. So that's what I did. I said to them, hey, I need a plastic surgeon. And I get an interesting phone call. Plastic surgeon that's on call calls me up and says to me, so listen, insurance companies change the coding for the way that they do this. They give everybody, whether you're a, you know, a, a PA, whether you're a doctor, whether you're a, uh, a plastic surgeon, they all get paid the same. It's just coded as a laceration and this is the way we do it. And so they said, clearly like we have more expertise than the next person and in order for me to come out, it's gonna cost you $2,500 to just show up. Like, and it's not gonna be you know, paid for by your insurance carrier, it's on you. I didn't have an option. What is my BATNA? to like let my little girl have a scar on her face? No, like there is no BATNA. She got the work done. It was $2,500, like just go, like let's just go because there was no better option. Like that was the best option. So in all fairness to him, he was a fantastic doctor and I, he did an unbelievable job. But the thought process is like there are situations that we come across where you don't have a BATNA. Like this is the best alternative. I wanna apply this now to real estate Actually, that's not true. I'm gonna give you an example. This is a best practices illustration. This is straight from Harvard's business school. So um, basically there's a problem that exists. A pretty awesome example. Teddy Roosevelt's 1912 presidential campaign prints three million campaign brochures using a, uh, a photograph of Teddy Roosevelt without asking permission of Moffitt Studios in Chicago, which owns the copyright. So that's the problem. The campaign manager realizes the error before brochures are distributed. Unauthorized use would cost a dollar a brochure, which is $65 million today. Clearly they can't pay for this. So do they just throw out 3 million brochures? No, they, they explore a little bit further and they look at BATNAs. They find out that research reveals that Moffitt is financially hard up, he's approaching retirement and he's likely to be focused on money. So what do you do? Any takers? Pay him three million. Pay him three million? Okay. So they actually, this is why this is a best practice because this is the best answer that I've ever heard. So this is what they did. The solution, 
We are planning to distribute millions of pamphlets with Roosevelt's picture on the cover. It would be great publicity for the studio whose photography we use. How would you like to pay us to use, how much would you pay us to use yours? Please respond immediately. Wow. Moffitt, who wanted more money, wanted the exposure related to this, sends back this reply. We've never done this before, but under the circumstance, we'd be pleased to offer you $250. They got Moffitt to pay, pay them. You have to understand BATNA. All right, so the BATNA checklist. This is something that if you go through this checklist and you kind of incorporate in this business, I guarantee you it's gonna help you. One, identify all the plausible things you might do without the other party if you are unable to reach an agreement. What are your options? Figure that out. Number two, calculate the value associated with each alternative. Number three, select which of these alternatives is best. This is your BATNA. Very basic, those top three. The fourth one is, is a game changer. And I'm gonna give you examples of the fourth one. The fourth one, always analyze the other party's BATNAs with equal care and objectivity. Why is that so important? I guarantee you by the time we're done with this, you'll get it. All right, so the first three, here's an example of that. BATNA checklist, and we're gonna talk about home inspections. So you get a home inspection, the house comes on the market for $400,000. 10 offers come in. The best offer is $600,000 cash. The second best offer is $500,000 and it's an FHA loan. What do you do? You accept the $600,000 cash, the seller is very happy and move forward. Now the buyer during home inspections asks for $50,000. What is your seller's BATNA? Very simple. Their BATN is $50,000 lower to go with that other offer. Having nothing to do with home inspections, we already know that FHA, they probably can't go up that much higher. You know, a $50,000 jump, like that's, that's extreme when you're dealing with FHA, you know, when cash is, is strapped. Like, so really what you're looking at is there's a $50,000 difference between these two offers. When you have a seller that's losing their mind over that $50,000 difference, sure, negotiate the home inspection. I'm not saying don't try to negotiate. But what I would say to that seller is, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, do you understand the risks attached to this negotiation? And they look at you and say, what do you mean? And I'd say, well, here's the thing. We put the house on the market, we got 10 offers. So clearly it was exposed to the market. And the thing is this, like, you know, in those 10 offers, we have $600,000 cash. So once we get past this home inspection, it's done. It's a done deal. This is the only hurdle standing between you and a closing table. And even though they're asking for something extreme, $50,000, which I get may be extreme, the reality is, is it's still $50,000 higher than the next best option. What are you thinking? Like, where's the question in this? If they would have came in originally at 650, excuse me, at 550, you would have accepted that offer? Of course you would have. Like it's still $50,000 higher than the next one. Why are we debating this? You understand? So you have to understand your BATNA, the seller's BATNA, and it'll help guide you in that. The next one, house comes on the market for 400K. 10 offers, best offer is 600,000 cash. Second place offer is 575 cash, but they waive the inspection. Buyer asks for the same $50,000. The BATNA is better going with the other offer. So it would, be, it would make more sense, assuming the other offer is still there, it would make more sense to skip to the second place offer. Pretty obvious. But here's the thing about that. When you're negotiating that with the buyer's agent, I would say to them straight up, like, listen, I'm just going to be real with you. This is a very competitive situation. You're asking for a $50,000 credit. This deal is going to die. Like there is no way that my seller is giving you $50,000 because quite frankly, they have a better alternative on the other side and they'll jump to the other offer. I'll literally say it just like that. You know why? Because now they know the pressure's on you, buddy. Like it's not on me. You want this deal to close? Get it closed. Get your buyer to be more reasonable because if they're not more reasonable, we're going in the other direction and we're going to walk away with more money. Our bat is stronger. That's the way that I would approach that in a, in a negotiation for a home inspection. So the BATNA checklist, I'm gonna skip down to number four because this is an awesome example. Hopefully it'll help you. When you talk about analyzing the other side, this is a great illustration. Again, this one's pulled from Harvard. So in the late 1980s, early 1990s, Mississippi legalizes riverboat gambling. An entrepreneur approaches a farmer to buy land for casino development. 
Before the meeting, the farmer hires an agricultural professor to estimate the value of the land. Agriculture professor conducts soil tests and estimates cash flows to conclude that the land is worth $3 million. What is the problem? Any takers? Ding, 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 ding. The seller's BATNA is way lower than the buyer's BATNA. And if you only looked at the seller's side, they're leaving a ton of money on the table because we're only looking at it from a farming perspective. This is not gonna be a farm. This is gonna be a casino. Casinos bring in tons and tons of money. Problem is with a three million valuation. So here's the illustration. In the negotiation, the farmer keeps quiet and allows the entrepreneur to make the first offer. Entrepreneur offers $7 million. Farmer negotiates further and eventually reaches a deal at 8.5 million. If they, just, if they just looked at their BATNA, they would be leaving five and a half million dollars on the table just because they didn't look at the other side. You have to understand what the other side is. BATNA is all about perspective. You gotta see the other side. So let's talk about a BATNA checklist related to confidentiality. This is a big one for you guys. When you, you know, you're out there and you know, a lot of times, especially newer agents, you don't realize that some of the things that you could say about your client could be devastating to their interests. And I'm gonna give you an easy example of that. Client is selling and buying with a 1031 exchange. For those of you who don't know what a 1031 exchange is, basically means that I'm selling one asset, I'm pulling all of the, the funds from that asset to buy another asset. There's a time frame involved in all that, and there's a whole you know, procedure involved in that, but I'm taking one asset, selling it, buying another one, and here's the thing. I'm not taxed on that money because that's basically they're saying it's a like for like exchange. All right, so this is what happens. They sold their home, they have 30 days left, time goes on, they have 30 days left to, um, to complete the exchange or they're gonna owe $300,000 in taxes. The buyer finds a the property they want and the buyer's agent opens their big mouth and explains to that seller that they're doing a 1031 exchange and what the terms are of that exchange. How likely is that seller to negotiate? They're not gonna negotiate. You, uh, you want my house, I want X, you want it for Y, but you have a timeline on you. And if you don't buy it within this timeline, guess what? There's a $300,000 penalty to you. Why would I move off of my number? It's gonna be way more costly to you than it is to me. So that interest, the interest of that seller have just been given up because somebody decided not to you know, withhold their you know, confidentiality uh, you know, uh, rights. Bat in a checklist in terms of escalation clause. This is an awesome example. Ben, I'm glad you're here for it. <laughs> this involved Ben Garrison, so a um, really cool example from years ago. So this is a true story, just to be clear. Um, we have a, a house that comes on the market. I think I got the numbers right. It's very close if I didn't. But a house enters the market for $900,000. We get two offers on the property. Ben has one of the offers, so it gets pushed to me because Ben is also the listing agent. So it gets pushed to me. By the way, Ben has the lower of the two offers to throw that out there. So it gets pushed to me and these two offers come in and I am now negotiating this with the seller. So obviously I represent the seller. So buyer A, this is Ben's offer, $900,000 final and best. They, they were just coming at asking price. Like buyer B comes in with 925, however, they also include an escalation clause of $5,000 up to a max of 950. So for those of you who don't know how an escalation clause works, basically says, I'm gonna offer you $5,000 higher than the best offer that you have up to 950. And the way that works is you have to disclose what your best offer is, and then I'm gonna take that best offer, add $5,000 to it, and beat that offer. That's an escalation clause. Okay, so this is the scenario that happens. The Seller says, except buyer B, excuse me. Uh, what did I do here? <laughs> oh, so the seller obviously wants to accept buyer B. You know, seller's bat is twenty-five to fifty thousand dollars less if they accept buyer A. So what does the seller say to me? The the thing that every seller in the history of time is going to say to you in these situations. They're going to say, great. Tell buyer B we'll accept their 950 offer. But hold on for a second. 
you don't have 950 on the table. You, don't, you have essentially 925 with a $5,000 escalator based on the other offer. But we can't release the other offer. The other offer is 900,000. They're gonna know they're overpaying at 925. So we go back and forth and I say to them, listen, you can't do that. We can't like, this puts us in a worse position. We can't release the 900. We can't just go back to them. We could counter to them at 950. But here's the thing. We don't know their propensity for what they're willing to pay for this house. And the seller says, what are you talking about? We know what it is. They told us. And I said, well, wait a second. That's not true. I said, we think we know their propensity for what they're willing to set, what they're willing to pay for this house, but we don't really know. And I'm going to take it a step further. Escalation clause for me reveals something about the buyer's BATNA. And if you guys ever get an escalation clause, this is something that would stand out in my mind. Here's what it reveals to me. The buyer's willing to pay more, but they want to see if they could get away with paying less. That's what they're doing. So anytime you get an escalation clause and you're like, oh, they're willing to go up to X, Y, and Z, whatever it is, don't view it as a positive. It's not a positive. This is the buyer trying to get away with something. They don't want to pay a max price. So I said that to the seller. I said, listen, I view this as this buyer really wants this house. Why else would they not, well, why wouldn't they, you know, why would they come in with a firm number? They're putting an escalator on. They really want the house. They just don't want to overpay. But I think that if we go back to them with a conversation, it may actually help them come with a firm number that you're going to like. The seller was like, I don't know. I don't know if we should do this. Like, maybe we should go back. And I explained all the risks. I said to the seller, I said, listen, you're 100% right. You could go back to them and you could accept the 925, but you're sending the wrong message. And they said, what do you mean? And I said, well, if you accept the 925, they're going to know that it's, it certainly didn't go above 925 because you would have used the escalator. So you're basically sending a, men uh, a message to them that you're, you're, you're putting a uh, benchmark on the house. I don't want to put a benchmark on the house. I want them to define what they're willing to pay for it. So don't do it that way. And he was like, all right, Mike, like, I want the 950. What do you suggest? And I said, you got to roll the dice on this one, but I feel very good that it's going to work out for you. And so he's like, all right, what do you suggest? And I said, I want to go back to the buyer's agent with this. We appreciate your offer, but the seller is not going to disclose the other offer. We're going to give you the opportunity to come back with a firm number before the seller makes his decision. So the agent was looking at me like, well, are they going to get it? Are they not going to get it? And I said, listen, right now we don't have a firm offer for you. So we have to go in a different direction. But if you come back with a firm offer, like, yeah, we could, you know, hopefully we can make this work. I didn't, I never said that they were the higher offer, the lower offer, whatever. I said the seller can't make a decision because they don't have a firm offer on the table. It was implied in their mind that they need to make this happen in order to get this house. So what did they come back with? What was the buyer B's firm number? 975. Any other takers? Million. Keep going up. Million one. Ben, was the seller happy? Very happy. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. <laughs> so I'm very happy too. We are we make these assumptions in this in this crazy world of real estate of what we think a buyer is willing to pay, what we think a seller is willing to accept. If we give it back to them and basically put them on the spot to make their own decision and force them to put a firm number, they didn't want to lose this house. They were just testing it out. They were doing what buyers do. They're putting out like a, you know, a, a lower um, anchor is what it's called. They're putting, and we're going to talk about that, but they're putting out a lower anchor to see what they get away with. Once they realized that they weren't getting away with it, they said, you know what? We can't lose this house. Let's make it happen. That's what happens. <laughs> Go ahead. Try to get to the pink lower. I just say you got to step up right away. Yeah. And no escalation clause. So what do you think of that? So. Whoa, that's and I was told yeah. yesterday. Oh, I don't know who told you that because that's not true. So. Just to be clear, you are allowed to use escalation clauses at Coldwell Banker. Just clarify that. I don't like if you're on the buyer side and the buyer feels like, hey, this could be helpful. Use it. If it helps you get the deal, I'm good with it. Like the the flip side of it is on the seller side, which is Erica's question. So um, I'm going to get technical here for a second. But basically, 
when you're um, when you're dealing with a, a buyer that comes in on one of your listings, you can never tell them that the seller is not willing to do something unless you have that conversation with the seller and the seller is the one who says it. So. You know, you have to present every offer that comes in in writing regardless. You don't have an option. So if they want to come in with an escalation clause, they could do that. I would present it to the seller just like I would present any other offer. And then once I have that discussion with the seller, it's then up to them through our like advice, obviously, we're gonna have that conversation, but it's up to them to decide what they wanna do with it. I would always instruct the seller on this example. I would say to them like, my, you know, my two cents on this is you don't want to set a benchmark for this house. Like don't even counter because you don't even know what money you could always counter later if you wanted to. Like I wouldn't counter, let them come back with a firm price, see where it lands. Like, and if you need to counter to them or if you need to counter another party at that point, you do so. But I, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't restrict escalation clauses. I would just restrict them later in the process. That makes sense. Go ahead. And you can refuse to tell them what the next highest offer is. Like, oh, absolutely. Oh, no, no, no. Absolutely. Like, I would, listen, this is just a, a blank statement that I will say universally across the board. I would never, ever, 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 ever tell a buyer what the, the price of another offer is, ever. That would never happen, whether it's my buyer or any other buyer. And I'm gonna give you, I'm, I brought that up as, a, as an example because even the people that cheat in real estate, which I don't do, I play fair, but the people that cheat screw their buyers over sometimes. They'll come in and they'll say like, it's a multiple offer. You gotta be at X, Y, and Z number in order to get the house. Well, now their buyer gets that number and they're like, all right, I just gotta beat it by 5,000 they got the house. Well, then all of a sudden, five minutes later, another buyer decides, ah, I changed my mind, go up 30. Well, now your buyer thinks you're playing games with them. So like, I just would never release a benchmark for anybody because I just think it's, it's a bad policy. Um, that answer that question? Okay. So number three is Zopa. Zone of possible agreement. This is another key concept for you to understand. So it's a very simple one. It's like things that someone else could agree to, things that I could agree to, the in-between, that's the zone of agreement. Like, you know, we could figure it out. We could come to terms on, you know, in that, within that zone. Another way to look at this is you have the preference so that the bottom is the seller, the top is the buyer. Sellers obviously prefer to get more money but the lowest that their amount that they're willing to accept is what their BATNA is. Like, what is my best alternative? I'm not going to accept less than my best alternative. Same thing as with the buyers, it's just in reverse. They want to get the house for the least amount of money, but they're willing to you know, go up to their BATNA. Like, you know, this is the better than any other alternative I have. The in-between, that's the ZOPA. So let's talk about ZOPA, and I'm just going to give you another visual on how to look at it. Buyer's target point, buyer's reservation point. So that's like, I'm not willing to spend, reservation point is I'm not willing to spend more than this. You know, target point is I would love to get the house for this. The reverse is also true. Reservation point, I'm just giving you this terminology because if it's explained later, you'll understand. So reservation point is 900, you know, target price, that might be a list price is 1.1. Zone of possible agreement is between 900 and a million. Okay, let's call it, let's talk about haggling. Real estate is very much, it's called the traditional game is the way that they explain it at Harvard. So real estate is very much about haggling. It's like, I want 500,000, I'm gonna pay you four, back and forth and back and forth, that's what haggling is. Like, you know, if you go with a street vendor, I went to, I, I, years ago I, I traveled and I studied in China and like everything, whether you walk into a, a real store or you're on the street, it's haggling. Everything is haggling. It's like back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Like, and I, you know, you don't know any better. Like here, we don't walk into like, you know, whatever store and start to like say like, I'm not gonna pay you what's on that price tag. <laughs> like, you know, it's just, it's a different world. So I just remember that was like a very, it was like culture shock a little bit for when we were on that trip. In real estate, like most of what we do is haggling. Like it's this back and forth traditional game. So let's talk about some best practices related to that. First of all, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you these and then we're gonna actually go into detail on some of them. Set an effective anchor. Make sure the process is perceived to be fair. Manage your patterns of concession. Use strategies of persuasion and influence. And then if a gap still exists, seek agreement on the process to close the deal. So just for, for time purposes, I'm only gonna touch on three of these because I think that they're very important for, for real estate. Um, number one is anchoring. Think of your initial offer. 
So when you're thinking of, an, you're representing a buyer, let's just say, and your initial offer is, is an anchor. So when you're talking about like, you know, anchoring and we go back to this chart, like where does the buyer start? Well, here's a good way for you to understand where a buyer should start. Really these two questions, like, or two statements rather, you have to, you, you have to understand your knowledge of Zopa and you have to understand the other person's knowledge of Zopa. So what I mean by that is, okay, like let's just say that you have a feeling the seller's willing, you know, they're asking for 1.1 million, but you have a feeling that the seller's willing to accept less. How much less? Like where is, now you also may know how much your buyer is willing to, to come up. Like I know my buyer's willing to go to a million, but they're not willing to go to a million one, but I have a feeling that that seller will come below a million. They're gonna go to 900,000. Understanding that Zopa is crucial when you're talking about anchoring, when you're coming in with an offer. Like, and where do you start? Because here's the thing, you could push people based on their Zopa. So like, if you know that that seller is willing to come down to 900,000, I'm not gonna make a $900,000 offer because they're not, we're not gonna settle on $900,000 if I start there. It's so crucial for you. And, and by the way, how do, you, how do you figure this out? You ask the right questions. You ask the listing agent. Like, you know, I gotta be honest with you. You guys have been on the market for 50 days. I know it's crazy in today's market, but you guys have been on the market for 50 days. Like, you've been at the same price. Like, it's clearly not worth that. Like, you know, what's the, what's the situation with the seller? You think that, because I know my buyer's interested in this house, but I don't necessarily think that they're gonna come up anywhere close to this number. You know, and then what is, a, what is the listing agent gonna do? Oh, no, 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 come in with an offer, come in with an offer. You're always gonna get that. Like, bring me an offer. Like, well, now you kind of got them a little bit because you're like, yeah, you know, we're, we're, we're thinking about bringing in an offer, but here's the thing, we just don't wanna offend you. Like, no, you're not gonna offend them. Like, I've already been telling them like that their house is not worth a million one. Like, I told them originally their house is worth 900,000. Well, they're an idiot, but like, that, that happens all the time. Like, I can't tell you how much listing agents tell me about the other side. Now, me, as a, as a, you know, as a fierce negotiator for my clients, like, I'm going to do the opposite of that. I'm never giving up my Zopa. I'm never telling them that my buyer is willing to spend a million dollars because now I've just given up all leverage in that transaction. Like, so for me, like, understanding what their Zopa is, understanding what ours is, if you can figure that out and the other party doesn't, you win. You win. Every time you win. So here's the thing. The listing agent tells you the seller will accept 900. You have said nothing. Now you start whatever, 800, you know, 850, whatever it is. Start at some lower number because you know that, all right, the seller's not going to be happy with where I'm starting, but it may get them closer to that like bottom line finishing price, which is $100,000 lower than what my buyer really is willing to pay. They get a win you could set a more aggressive anchor. The anchor is just the starting point. That's what an anchor is, okay? So there's a bias to anchoring that you know, is worth noting. How we cling to the first piece of information we get. I'm gonna give you a really awesome example of this. Um, and this is also a true story. So years ago, when I was in sales, I had this house on the market uh, in Summit. And I, you know, I brought the house on the market, it was on Colt Road, beautiful home. We brought it on for $2.2 million. And, it was like 2007, 2000, like right in that range. Like it was when the market was like here and then it was like, you. So, I mean, it was a really rough market and this is a Wall Street driven crowd is what Summit is. So, I, you know, we brought the house in the market for 2.2 million, sat on the market for, I don't know, 20 days, whatever it was. And we get an offer finally. So we get the offer and the buyers come in with an offer of 1.7, but it's cash. $500,000 off what we're asking. Now my seller, who's very educated, he's not like, he's no dope. Um, he actually was a senior partner with KPMG, like one of the largest accounting firms, you know, in the world. Um, he, you know, he was like, no, <laughs> like, no. And I said, well, well, wait, wait. And he was like, no, like there's no way. And I said, listen, I get it. I get that, you know, you don't want to accept this offer, but you know, like Rome is burning like around us. And you know, the reality is, is like we got an offer and it is cash. Like, so there's, there's some benefits to that. What I need you to do is, you know, hey, this is his reaction, this is insulting, tell him to go away. So I said, what I need you to do and I think would make sense is just give me a little bit. And he was like, what do you mean? And I said, just don't say no. 
And he's like, what? He goes, Mike, I'm not coming anywhere close to this number. I go, I get it. That's the narrative that you're going to let me run with. But like, give me something. Just take a step in their direction. He goes, fine. You want a step in their direction? $5,000. That's it. I said, okay, $500,000, you know, <laughs> you know, gap, $5,000. Let's see what I could do. So I said, take a small step, obviously. This is what they came back with. Not the seller, the buyer. The buyer came up $495,000 to put the deal together. They were testing us to see what we could get, what they could get away with. And my narrative back to that, to that uh, buyer's agent is I said, listen, you, you've officially insulted my seller. Like, I'm just going to be real with you. We had a good relationship, me and the buyer's agent. And I said, you've officially insulted my, my seller. They're, they want no part of this offer. So we're off to a bad start here. I'm just going to tell you, I got them, which was a miracle, to come down $5,000. And why I say it was a miracle is because they're not happy with you right now. Like, but if you're going to make this work, I don't even know if there's more room here. Like, because it's just, we really, you shouldn't have started that low. Like, and they looked at me and she was like, all right, well, my buyers really love this place. I said, I'd suggest they come up. Like, come up. Like, let's see if we could put this together because if you don't come back with something really strong, this is not happening. They came up to our price. So there's a $500,000 gap. It cost us $5,000. I tell you that because when you're, when you're going back and forth like in a negotiation, we jump to these assumptions and sometimes we don't take the, the extra step to push a seller to just give us something. Like s something is better than nothing. Like it's better than saying no. That deal wouldn't have come together if I didn't get a $5,000 jump. Like $5,000 on a two, point, you know, $2 million house, it's nothing. But it was everything in terms of putting the deal together because they realized that we came in too low and the sellers kind of slapped our wrist and you know, now we have to pay for it. And that's what happened and we closed. And then everything else around it sold for $1.7 million for the next like eight years. So it really worked out well. Um, obviously, you know, buyer accepted the, the, the counter. So number two, um, make sure the process is perceived to be fair. And I, I put multiple offers up on this one because there's a couple of things that you have to realize about fairness in real estate. And, and this is not just in real estate, this is in life, but it, you know, it's also, it's studied. And this is something that Harvard has studied. So they looked at like, how important is fairness? And what they came out with is people will walk away from an offer, even if it's in their Zopa, it's in the range that they're willing to accept, if the perceived process is perceived to be unfair. So if they feel like it's not a fair process, even if you hit their terms, they're gonna walk away. Like statistically speaking, that's true. And I'm gonna take it one step further, that's even worse. Satisfaction with negotiation outcomes is more correlated with deal process measures than the objective deal outcomes. And what happens, what you guys don't realize is we're all in this effort to try to like make it you know, a, a good environment for our buyers and sellers. We want their experience to be a good one, like all of us do, because that's what leads to future business. But what we don't realize is when it comes to lawsuits, there are more people sued over poor bedside manner than their actual skill set. Like, so if a doctor walks in and says, just shut up and take the lollipop, like the, the likelihood of them getting a malpractice suit skyrockets compared to even if they made mistakes. And it's statistically proven over time that like poor bedside manner is really what pisses people off enough for them to like go after the jugular. So if you as an agent, like, and this is true for not only with the clients you serve, but it's also true for the agents you're working with in the marketplace. Every one of you, you don't have to shout out names, but every one of you has that agent where you're like, I hate that person. They always cheat. They never make it a fair process. Like, oh, suddenly their buyer won by a thousand dollars. Of course they did. Like we heard that a million times over. Every one of you has an experience like that. Who wants to do business with that person? Nobody. Like, it doesn't help them in the long run in dealing with the agents around them. So the perception of that is crucial. Number three, managing your patterns of concession. So this is an interesting one. 
When you're talking about managing your patterns of concession, the, the, the biggest thing is there's, there's a handful of points, but the midpoint rule is an interesting way to, to take it. So know the midpoint rule is basically like, it's the best predictor of final outcomes is the midpoint of the first semi-reasonable offer and counter offer. So if you've read Never Split the Difference, like that's an easy example. Like, you know, that his, his whole tactic is different than what we're talking about. I may do that at a future session because I really love that book and I love his, you know, his most recent one. I've been reading it. Um, but basically, you know, when you talk about that midpoint rule, if you're, you know, let's just say hypothetically, like, you know, you, you're, you're dealing back and forth with a client and, you know, you're on for a million dollars and the buyer comes in at 500,000. Well, that's an unreasonable offer. Like, that's not going to happen. But like, let's just say that they like their second step, their second counter is to come up to, you know, 900,000. Well, if you see that now we have a hundred thousand dollar gap. More often than not, it means that the buyer wants the house for 950. Like, you know, just have it in the back of your mind, like the midpoint rule. Like they're, you know, first reasonable offer, split it in half, and that's probably where they want to wind up because that's what most people do to negotiate. So if you're, you know, coming in and you're having these conversations, now the goal is, is first of all, is there a Zopa there? But like the goal is, is to, to have the conversation with your seller, like, listen, they probably want to come to 950. I can't guarantee you that. Like I'm not saying that they're going to, but a lot of times the midpoint rule like prevails, you know, so our job is to try to get them above 950. Let's see how we could do that. And now you're setting that standard for your seller. Doesn't necessarily mean that they're gonna go that way. Sometimes they don't and you know, and that's unfortunate because it makes you look a little bit bad with the seller. But what I'd say is like, I can't guarantee you like, you know, and reinforce that so they know. Second one is beware of large concessions. So this is a cool one, like median concessions trigger reciprocity, large concessions indicate that there is more to come. So, you know, if, if you go back to that example that I gave you before about, you know, the $500,000 gap, well, like if they jumped up, you know, they jumped up 495,000, so that's a different conversation, but you know, if they jumped up, you know, uh, 450,000, well, that's a, a telltale sign to my seller that they really want this house. Like they're willing to do what it takes to get this house. So we don't have to, you know, we don't have to, you know, have reciprocity here. We don't have to come down and match them in any way because they've taken such a large step in our direction that it shows that like we're in the, in the driver's seat here. Make sense? Next thing is signal the end of the road. This is a, this is a cool one to kind of keep deals smooth. So make smaller and smaller concessions. The parties need that back and forth in order to get them to you know, agree and, and concede. So understanding that there's a rhythm to it in terms of how you time that out, like you may jump up $50,000 in this step. Well, don't jump up another 50, maybe drop it to 40 and then 30 and then 20 to get to where you need to be. Like, so knowing that you're, you're and, and you're all along, you're having this narrative back and forth with the other agent. And I'm saying like, listen, this is a really, really tough step to get them to this place. I don't know if they're gonna come up from here. Like, if you, you know, if you guys are serious about making this work, you gotta get your seller down because I wanna put this deal together. I'd love to do a deal with you, but it's not gonna work unless you guys come up. Like, well, now you're, you have this narrative going on, whether that's true, not true, whatever, like, you know, there might be more room there, but if you're setting the stage for like the, the gap is closing in terms of how much room there is, you're gonna get a better result. So here's, here's something that's a fun one. I call this the secret sauce. Um, I absolutely, I love negotiation. And you know, all the stuff that I just talked about are, is a good framework for you to think about while you're negotiating. But this is the creative part. And, and this is the part that I honestly think that I built my career off of what I'm about to talk about. Um, and, it, and it pertains to negotiations with is serving clients, helping them like, you know, get what they want, buyers and sellers. It pertains to me going out and negotiating with agents in terms of retaining agents. It's me going out and recruiting agents. Um, me going out and doing real estate investments personally, like it applies to checks every box. Um, the creative side is, is where I feel like I'm, you know, I'm really good at this. So, we're gonna talk about options. And if you're looking at this orange, um, I wanna tell you a quick story related to this orange. It's kind of fun. So you have two sisters that are fighting over the orange. 
and they're going back and forth and back and forth over what, you know, how much of the orange they're going to get. And inevitably, they, uh, you know, they, they decide to split the orange in half. And the one sister takes, you know, the orange, you know, in terms of like the, the edible fruit piece of it and eats the whole thing and throws the peel out. And the other sister throws the edible fruit portion of it out and takes the peel and uses it for baking. Meanwhile, all along, they both could have just said, hey, you take the whole peel and I'll take the orange and we're both going to get what we want. But they didn't do that because they weren't thinking about options. They were only thinking about what I'm going to get. And options is that piece of the, you know, of the, the negotiation you know, uh, conversation that's getting people to understand, understanding what it is they actually need and want out of a transaction and understanding what you need and want and finding that middle ground. I love that part of real estate negotiation. I think that that is where I live. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Well, first of all, for a negotiator to reach an agreement that meets his own self-interest he needs to develop a solution, which, a solution which also appeals to the self-interest of the other. It's finding that piece that it works for both parties. All right, so let's talk about options. I'm gonna give you an example of, of an option contract. Um, and this is something that you know, was, for me personally, it was a personal investment. So it was a, a bed and breakfast. Um, they listed for just under a million dollars, $9.99, and they had a very limited rental history. So I offered them full asking price. Um, they accepted it. The home inspection was an absolute disaster. Like the whole house needed to get rebuilt. And, you know, and it was like really latent defects. It was things that I like, like even me knowing my way around a house and a home inspection, it was like stuff that I couldn't even have known. Like, you know, all sorts of damages and stuff like that behind walls and what have you. So it was $150,000 in repair. I feeling like I'm being reasonable, said, you know what, I want 75K. Like, this is, this is what I need. Um, you know, and it became a really tough negotiation back and forth. There's the traditional game, back and forth. Okay. So then I started thinking about it creatively. And I realized, I'm going to give you a little bit more context to help you with this. So the financing was really tough for this particular deal. Why it was tough is because they didn't have rental history. So because of that, the, the banks were requiring me to put down more money like significantly more. They wanted like 30, 35, 40%, depending on the lender. And they wanted a higher interest rate. It had nothing to do with me as the buyer. Like me as the buyer, prior to like, you know, being involved with this particular house, they were like, yeah, not a problem. You'll, you'll get the, la the loan. Now all of a sudden the terms changed substantially only because the seller didn't do their job for years about renting the property like they, they were supposed to. It's an investment property. So the other piece is the seller owned the home outright and they didn't need the cash. Like, so I said, all right, like, I'm kind of seeing some more of the picture here. The last piece is those repairs, they were real. Like, it wasn't like I was just like fluffing it up to try to get, you know, money back. Like the seller didn't want to pay for them, but they were real issues with the house that I needed to come out of pocket and spend cash on. So in thinking about all of this, I was like, how can I find an option contract that not only worked for me, but worked for them? Simple answer, seller financing. So why is seller financing such a no-brainer in the situation that I just gave you? Well, I'm gonna walk you through it and, and so you understand like what, why it made so much sense, because it made sense for me, but more importantly, it made sense for the seller. So, you know, I propose the following terms for seller financing, $250,000 down. So remember, it's a million dollar property, that's 25%. It's a good number down. Most banks, that's what they were require. In this example, Banks were asking for more because of rental history. So it protected the seller's interest. They have 25% day one, but it also worked for me because it was less money down than what banks were asking me for given the situation with the seller. So that's a win for both parties. Second piece is a 7% interest rate. So why? It helped the seller net more money for the house, but it also cost me less because of all the reasons I just gave you. They wanted more in terms of interest like banks out there. So that was a win for me, win for the seller. Four year balloon payment. I'm gonna pay you in full within four years. So naturally it gave the seller what they wanted because they didn't need the money today, but within four years they knew they were gonna get the entire amount. Like, so it wasn't a, a 30 year thing that they have to wait forever to get their money, but it also helps me because I needed two years of rental history in order to refinance and basically pay them out. Because once I had those two years, my rate's gonna be better, the, the, the lending environment was probably gonna be a little bit better than it was today, like all this stuff. Seller benefit, 
If they accepted this offer, they're gonna net 1.134 million for this home in four years time because they're gonna get everything that I'm giving them up front, the 250, plus a balloon payment with all of that interest. So remember, they were only asking for 9.99. I'm paying them 1.1 million. Nobody's paying them 1.1 million right now. Like they're not getting that. But within four years time, I'm guaranteeing that to them. Another thing is my benefit, I get my full $75,000 credit because that 1.1 million is including me getting $75,000 back in inspection credits. So I don't have to negotiate back and forth and have like, you know, them play that traditional game with me about why they don't want to give me a full credit. Hey, you could give me the full credit and you could still walk away with more money. Lower down payment for me because I don't have to put down more than 25%, less money in interest for the next four years because it's going to cost me more if I go to banks right now, given their situation. And with two years rental history, it's a better interest rate long term. I win, they win, they make more money, I save money, why would we not do this? I love you right now. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So when I presented this to the listing agent, the listing agent started laughing and he was like, because I wrote it up in an email, and the listing agent started laughing and he was like, I would sign this. And I was like, I know, <laughs> it's, it's a good structure, isn't it? And he was like, yeah, it makes complete sense. The seller like lit up inside over it because they were just like, this makes complete sense. Fortunately, the attorney killed it, but the, the reality is, is like, it wasn't because it wasn't a good deal. Like the deal, the deal itself made sense and it was like an easy, you know, an easy way to kind of like put all the pieces together. So, and sometimes attorneys will kill it, like it happens, but, in, you know, in, there are examples of seller financing all over the place that like it works. So it just, you just gotta find the right situation. Why did the attorney kill it? Because he's a putz. Yeah. Like, honestly, like the, the, the attorney killed it because he just likes to be difficult. Like I, I know this attorney and I said to him, I had a conversation with him and I was like, you know, not for anything. I'm literally putting more money in your client's pocket. Like, why wouldn't you do this? And, and he was like, well, there's risks attached to it. I was like, risks? I'm handing you $250,000 the day that I buy this place. Like, what do you think I'm gonna do, walk away? <laughs> you know, even if I walk away, you're in a better position than when I left you. You know, when, before you accepted this offer, you have your house that you foreclose on and my 250. Like, it makes no sense. Go ahead. So, uh, in case of default, you don't pay, the seller gets the property back. Yeah, the seller gets the property right back. Plus the 250, they keep my 250 and they get the house. Like, why would they not do that? And by the way, in this case, I was also, you know, I'm spending three, $400,000 in renovations. So they're gonna get a brand new house back. Like, you know, so it was, it's a no brainer. So the deal, I'm, yeah, they, they're essentially the lender. Like they, they become the lender. Now this worked because the seller owned the house outright. Like, but listen, I did buy this house. We structured it in a different way, but like, when I like sat down and put all this stuff together for them and presented it, I was like, this is a no brainer. And every party except for the attorney agreed. Like the attorney was just kind of a stickler, but it wasn't because the terms were bad. He just didn't want anything outside of the norm. Um, but you get the point about options. Like if you start getting creative about how you structure deals and you start thinking about, you know, what is in the best interest of this other party? What's in my best interest? You're going to find middle grounds. And you're going to be able to put deals together that you wouldn't otherwise. Um, I think that's it. That's all I got for today. So I appreciate your time. I really do. Any questions? No, I really appreciate you guys staying for as long as you did. We'll get the recordings out as soon as we can. Um, if you haven't already, uh, thank you, but sign up for the next one. I really have some awesome speakers coming up. I'm pretty excited about what we have. And I hope you enjoyed today's session. Like any feedback you have, like you want to see somebody that, you know, that we haven't brought up, come talk to me. I'm very much open to, uh, to listen to some ideas. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank